21 years ago in Cleveland, Ohio, I sat in a crowd and I lost my voice. As one of the biggest bands in the world at the time took the stage of the Cleveland Rib Fest, and it was as incredible as it sounds. <laughs> there were thousands of people. They were coming off just having the biggest song of the year, and there the Goo Goo Dolls took the stage. <laughs> and I got an education. I was a sheltered 16 year old Christian kid. I'd been to concerts before, but mostly Dave Matthews shows, and there everybody's just high, and it's a bunch of white people dancing high, and it's as ugly as it sounds, and, and this was just a bunch of ugly white people dancing drunk, and what comes with having the, one of the biggest bands in the world as a result, I got an education. And on the way home, my friend, who was a few years older than me and in college, looked over at me and he said this. You know, you don't have to be a rock star to have women act that way towards you. And I was like, teach me, sensei. Teach me. Because <laughs> I love Jesus, don't get me wrong, but I was a 16-year-old kid. I'm like, teach me. He said, all you have to do is make a lot of money. I knew the rock star wasn't going to happen. I'm like, make a lot of money. I could do that. I could totally do that. Really? That's all you got to do? Is make a lot of money? It's like, make a lot of money. A lot of money. <laughs> I'm like, all right. I got it. And so began my plan as a 16-year-old kid of how I was going to be one of the most impressive businessmen that this world has ever seen. I was going to have the sports car. I was going to have the high-rise apartment. I was going to have the floor side season tickets. And I was going to live the dream. I bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. And I knew that this was the direction my life would go. And I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it at all. Started to dream. Started to think about it. After all, this is the American dream. This is what everybody would want. I mean, this is the lifestyle that we are sold and we're told this is what you need. This is what you want. If you can achieve this, your life will be glamorous. It would be incredible. It'd be great. This morning, we're going to look, as we continue our, our series called Life, we're going to look at motives, we're going to look at dreams, we're going to look at what drives us and all the, all the wrestling that all of us have had to do at one stage or another in our lives, and maybe some of you right, are right there right now internally with this, with this wrestling of what what is my purpose? What really matters? What am I trying to achieve? What, what will be success? And what does that look like? And what do I want my life to look like? What do I want to define me? If you have your Bible apps, you can follow along in the events section. If not, you can look up Luke 12. We're going to start in verse 15. And if you don't have the app on your phones or on your tablets, you can follow along on the screens as we're going to join a conversation where Jesus is speaking. And I just want to remind you, week one, we saw that earlier in this same conversation, Jesus was speaking. This is, this is where we started our series life. We saw that the message of Jesus is one, that if we follow Jesus, we have nothing to fear. In this life and in death, we have absolutely nothing to fear if we're followers of Jesus. And then last week we saw how all life matters. Every single life is precious and all life matters because we are designed by our creator. 
And as life happens, we're, we're born and, and then we grow up. And, and really, for the first 12 to 14 years of our life, we, we face very, the vast majority of us face very little. Most of our decisions are made for us by our parents. And we start to get some freedom and we start to learn, hopefully, decision making so we can avoid some catastrophic things. But then something happens. And we start to plot and we start to course and we start to say, this is, this is what I want to go after. This is what I want. And so today we're going to look all at motives. And so join me as we look at Luke 12, starting in verse 15. And he, Jesus, said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Well, there goes my 16-year-old dreams right there. Right there. They're gone. But what I'm fascinated with is this idea to be on guard. To be on guard against this. What this means is we don't have to go out looking for this mindset. We don't have to go out seeking this. No, just the opposite. This mindset will come to us. That's why Jesus says, be on your guard. You don't have to be on your guard when you go out looking for trouble. It's when trouble comes to find you that you need to have your guard up and you need to be alert. And you may feel like you're insulated. You may feel like this doesn't really apply to me. I'm good. I haven't bought into all these things. No, 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 no. Jesus says, be careful. Because this mindset's coming for you. This mindset is coming for you. It's, It's always more. It's always I need something better. It's always what I have isn't enough. And you don't have to go looking for that mindset. That mindset will come and find you. And so Jesus says, be alert and be on your guard. And so I'm just telling you, for your own peace of mind right now, determine what's enough. And not just for right now, but determine enough that if you have resources beyond what you can even imagine right now, determine enough Otherwise, you will fall prey, and you will constantly be trying to do bigger and better and bigger and better. And we've all seen the numerous stories of people who have amassed fortunes of millions and lost them just as quickly. Why? Because they never determined enough. And when you don't have a target that you're aiming at, the target constantly moves. And when that's the case, you will never be satisfied. You just never will. So determine what is enough. And understand that your enough is not going to look like somebody else's enough. And that's okay. These don't have to be uniform. Your enough may be more than my enough. My enough may be more than your enough. And that's okay. But make sure that you define what is enough so you have a target that you're aiming at. And you can know when you hit it. But if you don't have that target, I promise you, you are inviting turmoil in your life. And Jesus says, you be on guard against this. Because because covetousness, it will find you. And you might not think you have anything to worry about. But he said, it will. Be on your guard. And remember, what you own doesn't determine the score of your life. Your life is not defined by your possessions. What you own doesn't determine the score of your life. And so Jesus really wanted to get this point home. And so he continued. And he told them a parable, verse 16 says, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. 
The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Now listen, in, in the scheme of problems, this is a great problem to have, right? I mean, a lot of us have, we've all experienced problems, and some problems are better than other problems. And, and on a scale, this is a really great problem. Well, things are going so great, I don't know what I'm going to do with all this stuff. That is a really great problem to have. But he needs a plan in the story that Jesus tells. He needs a plan to handle the excess. He needs a plan. Here's the reality. While this is a great problem to have, it's still a problem. Success can kill businesses. Success can absolutely kill businesses. We've all seen the story of the business that's grown too big, too fast. And they weren't able to scale. And they tried their best, but they just weren't able to keep up with demand. Or in their attempts to keep up with demand, they took on way too much product. And then they, become, they became bankrupt as a result. Success can kill business. Either because it happens too quickly. Or because it happens... It's, it happens in a, in a manner that is more sustainable, but then people get lazy. They rest on their accomplishments. They rest on their achievements. They feel as though they've arrived, like no one will be able to topple them. And we've all seen those stories as well. Success can kill business, but it can also kill you. Success can also kill you. I don't know if you saw just a couple weeks ago the, the post that Bieber put on his Instagram page, but it was absolutely gut-wrenching. As he talked about the process of growing up and how he lost himself. How he was surrounded by nothing but people who would enable his every desire and it led to a place of abuse of substances, of, of, of situations that he looks back on now with nothing but regret. And it was just heart-wrenching to read the caption that he wrote. Maybe some of you come from a family where as soon as real success entered the picture, mom and dad couldn't make it anymore for whatever reason. And what was a source of stability and a strong foundation in your life crumbled with the divorce. And it left you reeling. And it left you wondering, if they can't make it, who can? And what can I really count on? What can I really believe in? Success can be incredibly dangerous. And so Jesus continues in the parable in verse 18. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. So I have, I have this great problem. I have too much. Things are going well. I have too much product. So I've got a plan. I'm going to build, I'm going to tear down the barns that I have. And I'm going to build bigger barns so that I can store everything. This is, a, this is an expansion plan. And this is a good plan. On its face, this is a good plan. I have more than I can handle, so I'm going to tear down what I currently have. I'm going to build something that is bigger to, to facilitate this success. And then we're going to be all right. That's going, that's going to help us out. This isn't a bad plan at all on its face. This is actually a really good plan. It's sound. It makes sense. Build up reserves. Save. This is what we would encourage everybody to do with their personal finances. Build up reserves. Save. Be responsible. Don't go blow everything at once. This is a really sound plan. And for many of us, this is the dream of our lives. For many of us, this is the dream of our lives. 
this is the American dream. That we've worked really hard and we've experienced success. And so now that we've experienced success, we're going to save up. We're going to build up our reserves. We're going to upgrade. This is the American dream. And this can completely destroy you. Hear me out. Am I saying that wealth is wrong? Not even a little bit. Am I saying that you shouldn't have a plan and shouldn't save? No. In fact, you're foolish if you don't. That's what scripture tells us. But I'm telling you this, that if this is your aim, you will be destroyed. If this is where you find your fulfillment, if this is where you find your purpose, you will fall prey. I can't tell you how many people I know who are constantly wrecked with feelings that they're not enough and they haven't done enough because this idea has come into their mind somehow that they haven't lived up to their potential. I've struggled with it. Some of the darkest battles I have ever faced in my own life have been this idea that I have not lived up to the potential that I have. And there's nobody that can help you when you're going through this because it's an inner war and it's a turmoil. And so you wrestle with yourself and you beat yourself up and what I've achieved isn't enough. I haven't done enough. I haven't impacted enough. I haven't accomplished this or I haven't achieved this. And this idea of potential can paralyze you and it can absolutely destroy you. And it doesn't have to come from anyone out there. It doesn't have to come from expectations of society. In fact, it's more dangerous when it doesn't and when it comes from in here. And you're left wondering, have I made it? Have I done enough? And then he continues in verse 19, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat. Drink. Be merry. I mean, this is basically every Post Malone song right here. That's what he's saying. You've got the money? Go party. You've achieved something? Now go enjoy it. So you have everything laid up. You have the ample goods laid up for many years. Chill out. Relax. Eat. Drink. Be merry. What's crazy is this is basically everyone's college experience as well, only without the ample goods laid up. All right, that's why we have a student loan crisis in America right now, because you don't have any money. In fact, you have less than no money. You're completely broke, and either you're really lucky and your parents are paying for your college, or you're signing your life away on student loans that don't go away even if you declare bankruptcy. And so you're like, ah, all right, whatever, let's have fun. And then something happens. You go and you get in the grind. And for a lot of people, what happens is they start out, they get in the grind, they enter the dating world, they get married, they have a young family, they're broke, they know it, they're just trying to make ends meet. And then sooner or later, something really weird happens and all of a sudden, they can finally catch their breath. And now they have some resources. And you fast forward a decade or two, and now they really have some resources. And the kids in a perfect world are out of the house, and they have some freedom. And then they start to question, what's this all about? And for a lot of people, they don't know how to answer that question. 
So it becomes a sports car or a mistress or an obsession with the gym or trying to act like you're 20 years younger and you're the age of your daughter's friends instead of the age of you and your friends. Whatever the case may be, the midlife crisis comes into play. And all of a sudden, it's the very same mindset of every college kid. Relax. Eat. Drink. And be merry. See, it's the mindset that my pleasure is paramount to my existence. That my pleasure is paramount to my existence. That when I look over my existence, what really matters is my pleasure. That's what's really important. So here we have a story that Jesus is telling of somebody who's done nothing wrong, who's experienced good problems, who has a sound plan for what to do with those problems, and has arrived at a point where they have some resources, and they say, I'm going to enjoy what my resources have offered me. But Jesus isn't done. And verse 20 says this, But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. In the things you have prepared, whose will they be? All that you've stored in those new barns, all of this mindset that you have, to relax, to eat, to drink, to be merry, to relax, to chill, and to go party and enjoy the fruits of your labor. God says, tonight you're dead. Now, thank God this is just a parable. Because can you imagine if this was a real story and somebody went to Jesus and he was telling the story of their life and then he looked at them and said, tonight you're dying, right? Like, that's a... At least he's talking to Jesus, like, help me, Lord. This is sobering. This is absolutely sobering. And it should pause, cause us all to pause and to ask the question, now what? Now what? Because here's the sad reality. So much of what we work so hard for doesn't matter in the long run. Because we can't take it with us. With the bridge that's out, and probably going to be out until 2022 at the pace that I see them working on it, (laughs) Thoughts and prayers for all of us on that project, just down the road. I try, to, I try to avoid having to go around the detour there. So I drive out by the cemetery when I come into town every day. And it's a reminder as I'm coming into town as I look over to my left. There's some large headstones. Looks like there's some simple stones just in the ground. That's the scorecard. Not the house we live in, the clothes we wear. The car we drive, how good our Packer tickets are, that's the scorecard. And that's our destination. Hear me out, I'm not trying to sound fatalistic. I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't have a nice house or you shouldn't drive a nice car or you shouldn't go do things and enjoy things and you shouldn't save up money and enjoy. But I'm telling you this, you must be on your guard and keep it in the proper perspective. Because if you don't, 
All that means is that your kids and your grandkids are going to hate one another when you die because they're going to go to court and battle over your estate. And the legacy you've left is it's all about things. So Jesus says, be on your guard and focus on what? Focus on what you're chasing after. Wealth is not evil. Wealth is not wrong. Wealth is a blessing from God. And there's nothing wrong with it so long as we keep it in its proper perspective. So is the one, verse 21 says, who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. What we discover is when we try to build empires for ourselves, there is an emptiness that follows. It's not enough. And when instead we see that our lives are bigger than what we own... And the scorecard is not the house that we own or the cars that we drive or the clothes that we wear, etc. We can live with purpose. And we can live with a purpose that just, it just squashes everything else. When we live for God's kingdom primarily, we will experience joy and fulfillment Versus the emptiness of trying to build our own platforms in our own kingdom. That's one of the reasons that God instituted this idea of giving back to Him. It's a safeguard. It's a safeguard. And when we give back, To God, what we say is we understand that everything I own ultimately isn't mine. And when we have that mindset, when we really have that mindset, it frees us up from so much stress and so much worry. Because we understand we're just stewards. None of us are owners. None of us own anything. We're all just managers. And the way I can prove it is because we're all ending up in the ground. It was 2002. After my freshman year of college. My freshman year of college was a hard year for me personally. I knew that God wanted me to give my life to to do this. But man, I wanted the high-rise apartment and the sports car and the season tickets. And so I made a compromise with God going into college. I did. And I said, God, here's what I'm going to do. I will declare a double major... And I will go to school for business finance and for ministry. And in those four years, you'll understand that I can be just as effective in a church, not as a pastor, but as something else. And and that's not to say that the role of the pastor is more important than any other role in the church. Understand that. It's just what God was calling my life to. So you won't need me for that. Cool. Cool. He didn't say anything in my heart or anything like that. I'm like, all right, we we good. So I went, and I love business. And I enrolled for a business class that I was so excited about. And I've never been more miserable in my life. Never. I'm like, fine. I'll do the ministry thing. Whatever. But I wasn't happy about it. It was the summer after that year. The Goo Goo Dolls had a new album out. 
Confession's good for the soul. It was the first album I ever downloaded from Napster. All right, I know some of you don't even know what Napster is. I downloaded it from Napster, which was illegal. I burn it onto a disc. I'm driving along in my car. And of all things, God spoke to me and used the band The Goo Goo Dolls on an album I stole. (laughs) I was driving around. Because on the follow-up album, Gutterflower, to the most successful album that they'd ever had, and again, their song, Iris, was the most played song in all of 1998. They released a song called Sympathy. Stranger than your sympathy, and this is my apology, I'm killing myself from the inside out, and all my fears have pushed you out. And I wished for things that I don't need, all I wanted, and what I chase won't set me free. It's all I wanted. And I get scared, but I'm not crawling on my knees. Oh yeah, everything's all wrong, yeah. Everything's all wrong. Where did I think I was? And stranger than your sympathy, I take these things so I don't feel. I'm killing myself from the inside out, and now my head's been filled with doubt. It's hard to lead the life you choose, all I wanted. And all your lucks run out on you, all I wanted. And you can't see when all your dreams are coming true. Oh yeah, it's easy to forget, yeah, when you choke on the regrets. Who did I think I was? And stranger than your sympathy and all these thoughts you stole from me. And I'm not sure where I belong and nowhere's home. And I'm all wrong. And I was in love with things I tried to make believe I was. And I wouldn't be the one to kneel before the dreams I wanted. And all the talk and all the lies were all the empty things. Disguised as me. And God wrecked me. a Goo Goo Doll song (laughs) on a stolen CD. Because that's where I was heading. And that's what I wanted. And here's one of the most famous bands in the world on their follow-up album. Just crying out, it's all so empty. I thank God for that stolen album. I later bought it just because I felt guilty. (laughs) But God used it. So what's God want to get through to you? And are you listening? So he can use a stolen album from the Goo Goo Dolls. Don't chase after it. It's empty. What defines you? Are you a prisoner to your own potential? Are you willing to live for God's purpose? That's the question you have to answer. Nobody else can answer it for you. But I promise you this. If you live for his purpose, and what he's called you to do, and forget about potential, and forget about all these other things, you will find freedom. And that's the path to peace. God, I pray you'd give us peace. I pray you'd help us live for your kingdom, not our own. Let our pursuits be driven by yours. 
that our focus would be your glory. That we wouldn't be held captive to the lie of potential. And that our focus would be on you. Let each of us determine enough. Be on guard. Be glorified in our lives, we ask. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.